Welcome to the Impactful Leadership Show. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. John Lennon once said, a dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. Join me as we connect dreams to reality by chatting with innovators from around Washington, DC. Our show is proudly sponsored by the DC chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization. This is the Impactful Leadership Show. Well, welcome to the Impactful Leadership Show. My name is Greg McDonough. I'm the founder of Blackburn Capital Advisors and the chapter president of the Entrepreneurs Organization of Washington, DC. Today's guest it fell into entrepreneurship. She is a co-founder and president of JLM Stat- Strategic Talent Partners. She took a non-traditional path, which has led to major successes in her business alongside her husband. Over the past 10 years, she's provided talent and built a community within the transportation and infrastructure sector of the construction industry. She recently launched a podcast in the middle of the pandemic titled uh, Real Talk with LaShondra. LaShondra Mercaris, welcome. Well, thank you, Greg. Well, that was a, a mouthful. I wasn't sure if you were <laughs> going to get all of that out. Well, let me tell you, when we when we did that name change, I swear it was like a tongue twister. But I, I you know, I couldn't figure out how to include everything that we were about. You know, we're strategic. We want to be partners. And, you know, we have this passion to provide talent. JLM Strategic Talent Partners, baby. So that's how <laughs> <laughs> that long name ended up <laughs> on our bank account. Awesome. Isn't it amazing how all that thinking and strategic ideation kind of comes together? And then if you try to say it quickly, you just got to practice and practice. So I appreciate your patience um, through my intro. Well, as you know, we've talked about this before that our podcast, my podcast, we focus on leadership. And my favorite question to ask my guests is tell me some misconceptions in leadership. Ooh, that's a good question. It actually, you know, kind of gave me chills because when I think about leadership, and if you ever listen to my podcast, Real Talk with LaShondra, I really talk about leadership and entrepreneur from an emotional and human place. I know people say, ah, emotions doesn't belong in business, but that's just not true. And I think that, you know, when I think about the first misconception is that emotions don't belong in business or leadership. And I think that's absolutely not the case because I think that most leaders are driven by their emotions. So that's that's one misconception. And I think the second misconception that I would put out there is that leadership is about getting others to do what you want them to do. And I think that's bullshit, if I may say. Because what leadership is really about is discipline and accountability of yourself. And through that, the example that you're setting when you have discipline and you have accountability will naturally radiate to the people that are aligned with that. And that's how you gain true leadership. You know, absolutely. And I love your insight there. Um, And I remember in my previous business that I took over in a bankruptcy process, I got very much tied into the emotional side of leadership and it could be dangerous too, right? I mean, it's, you could become so emotionally attached to your business that you lose sight of what its purpose is or what the people are trying to accomplish there. So it's, it's, to your point, it's a very tricky or delicate touch Um, when it comes around leadership and emotion. Um, I would love to dig in a little bit deeper on your second point around accountability of yourself. Well, I mean, the way that I see it is, you know, when you're in a leadership position, you know, you, you're on the front lines. I mean, you're leading. And a lot of times, especially in entrepreneurship, you're leading in the dark. So (laughs) there's not really, you know, a, a path necessarily. You're blazing the path, which means that, you know, you have to be the example. And, you know, and people always say you can't ask people to do what you're not willing to do. So, so the way that you blaze that path and the way that you conduct yourself is setting the precedence, is providing the standard. So if you're not being disciplined and you're not doing your own inner self work, um, then it's going to be very difficult for you to expect others 
to do the same. I really like where you were going um, sort of with, you know, how to incorporate emotion in business. You know, I, I do like your take on it as well. But I think that, um, you know, the place that I really come from when it comes to emotions in business is not necessarily being emotional. There's a, a clear distinction between being emotional and harnessing and understanding your emotions, because how you how you interpret and understand your own emotions will drive how you make decisions in business. And if you eliminate emotion from business, then you miss out on the opportunity to really feel into where it is that you want to go as a leader and how you want to guide those that are following you. So you have to be able to take in those emotions, understand them, you know, feel them, not suppress them, don't push them down. Don't act like they don't exist because that's where the magic happens. That's where, you know, your strategies or your processes and your goals meet actualization. Because again, leadership is about how you make people feel. And Very if you make people, if, if people can feel you and feel your emotions and your passion about where it is that you want to go, they're going to step up for you and they're going to help you realize that goal or that um, passion or whatever that is. But they have to feel it. You see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? They can't do it unless they feel it. And they can't feel it unless you as a leader can feel it. Very true. Very true. And, and looking over... Your career, when did you discover that for yourself, that that was part of your, leader, your leadership talent? Hmm. Well, I, I guess in a way, I've always kind of known it was there. I don't know that I always had words for it, but I always understood that once I stepped into a leadership position, that the way that I role is going to be critique. You know, everyone is looking at me. And when I started to see, you know, people starting to adopt some of the philosophy that I had and some of the techniques that I had um, without me even asking them, they just begin to really mirror what I was doing right then and there was um, it, it, it showed me the power that I had. And so once I had a realization of how much you know power I had and, and how all my movements were being looked at and considered, that is, I guess that's the point. I want to say back when I worked for um, the financial recruiting firm where I actually met my husband, um, but I think you know the story, I actually hired him and we became business partners. That's how we how we met. Um, it was there that I really understood. And he was actually one of the first people that really put words to that. Because when, when he came there, he said, you know, um, on my first day of work with you, I think almost everybody in the office took me aside to tell me about you and how you led. Mm -hmm. And some of it was positive. Some of it wasn't so positive. But that let me know that, oh, everybody is watching me. And then he said, at a, at a later date, he said, you know, on that day when everyone was coming to me and giving me all their feedback about you, he said, I just looked around and I realized, oh, you're the one. You are the one. So there Both you go. From a both from a marital perspective and from a business perspective. <laughs> there you go. According to him, we, we started dating, uh, what was it? June 15th, 2006. Uh, that was the day of his interview. So it, it took me a few months to catch up, <laughs> but I eventually got there with him. That's awesome. So let's, let's dive in again a little bit deeper because you made, you, you made a comment about everybody's watching you. And when you're in a leadership position, you are being watched. Um, both leadership and your family and also in your business and in your community, right? People say that your kids don't listen to you, but they watch what you do. So that's how you should lead by example. Um, and you've hired hundreds and hundreds of employees over your tenure. Talk to us about um, 
having how to handle that type of pressure, knowing that every employee that walks through the door, every you know employee you put out in the field, they're all sort of got their their eye on you. Talk to us about handling that sort of that back to emotion, that emotion, that pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said before, if, when you're in leadership, it's, it's a very selfless position. I think a lot of people think that leadership is, you know, uh, it's all about me. I'm the leader. Look at me, you know, look at, you know, I, so I'm so smart. I have all the, the, I have all the answers. It's, it's not that at all. Uh, leadership is, is very selfless. And especially when I went into business as an entrepreneur, I inherently knew that if I was going to take on employees, that those employees were more important in a sense. So, so as a leader, I could have my house could be burning down. But if one of my employees has a hangnail, that hangnail is more important in a sense. Because as a leader, you, you know, you, you're of service to the people that you're leading. And no matter what's going on, you always have to show up, you know, in a place of service. So that's how I approach leadership. Powerful. Um, changing directions a little bit. You mentioned you work with your husband. I've interviewed a handful of entrepreneurs who are in a marital relationship and a business relationship with the same person. Do you have any advice or, or thoughts that you could share around how do you make that work? Because you kind of don't ever get away from each other, right? <laughs> nope. You know what? That's actually true. And, and it really depends. Every, every working relationship with your significant other or spouse is, is different. Um, for us, it was interesting because our relationship started out as a working relationship and then led into a personal relationship, right? So it, it's kind of re, kind of reverse because usually it starts out personal and then leads into you know starting a business together or whatever. But for us, it was the opposite. So the working relationship has always been a part of our relationship, and I want to say. Sheesh. I mean, we've been together 16 years and it's only been in, I would say, the last year that we haven't spent literally 24 hours a day together. So how do I make that work? Um, a, a few things. It's there. There's a lot of self-work involved, because remember, over time, the person that you start out, started out working with is not going to be the same person <laughs> in the end. There's a lot of evolving that has gone on. And specifically in my relationship, it's really a battle between who is going to occupy the masculine and feminine space at any given time. Right. So when you think of, you know, masculine, you think of very, you know, hard driving, um, focused, you know, very penetrative sort of a position. Right. And then you think of, you know, the feminine where it's more abstract, creative and very in flow. So for me and my husband, I, as the female, started out in the very masculine role where my husband, you know, sat in the feminine role because he is creative. I mean, he's a brilliant business mind and the way that he looks at business, you know, and being a visionary is very creative. It's very in flow, right? But there did come a time in our working relationship where he was like, um, I'm tired of sitting up in this feminine. I'm gonna need you to scoot over so I can step into my masculine because I'm ready to step up you know, and, and not even step up. I'm ready to step into more a, of a masculine leadership role. So that dynamic was really tough. So it's really recognizing, you know, the, the masculine and feminine in yourself and figuring out how to manage that so that you can leave room for your partner to shift, you know? And so that's not always easy. And we've had our moments. Oh, believe me, we've butted heads plenty of times. And, you know, there's been a few times where I'm like, you know, I'm having fun in this masculine space. I really, I'm really not ready to leave yet. He's like, but you got to go. So, um, <laughs> so that's really the key, you know, um, it's just understanding, you know, how to fall back when your partner needs to express themselves in any 
you know, given way, whether it's a masculine or feminine expression. Fantastic. You mentioned at the beginning, um, you commented around self work. Um, are there any tips or tricks or things that you do like meditation, yoga that help you with your self reflection and your self work? Yeah. Um, I don't do no, I don't do no yoga. <laughs> I, I don't know about most entrepreneurs, but my brain is on all the time and I struggle with meditation. Like I literally want to kill myself. So I don't necessarily do any, any of that, but what I do focus on is, you know, self-care. I do make sure that I have time to enjoy life. You know, it doesn't always have to be about business, but I think, um, you know, going on different retreats and, you know, having time for yourself, having time with other people that are like-minded that might be going through similar things. I think, you know, that human connection of being understood and having your experience, not necessarily be validated, but being able to express how it makes you feel and getting all of that out. So, you know, when, when you sit in, you know, in a masculine space, which typically business and entrepreneurship is that it's very interesting. It's very important that you release, you have to put yourself in a position to release, you know, all of the, the tension and the stress and the pressure, you know, that happens. So whatever, you know, makes me feel like I can do that is, is what I do. And sometimes, sometimes it's just sitting on the couch watching Real Housewives of Atlanta and watching all these cackling women, you know, have at each other, you know, some mindless entertainment, um, you know, really helps me center and helps me get out of my head and into my emotions and into my heart so that I can start releasing all the things that are no longer serving me. So that when I do step back into those roles, I can show up complete and whole, if that makes sense. Totally makes sense. You know, I was presenting to a group of uh, soon to be entrepreneurs this last summer and somebody asked, you know, how do you start, how do you get your business started? And my answer was find your tribe. You find the people that you want to be with, find the, the group that you feel supported in because without that your entrepreneurial journey is going to be really, really difficult. Exactly. Exactly. So, right. So speaking of paths, Lissandra, talk to us about your path. How did you end up in this male dominated <laughs> infrastructure, construction, hard hat wearing mm-hmm. industry? Take us through your story from, from as far back as you want to go to today. Ooh, well, I mean, well, first of all, you know, I had a non-traditional path to entrepreneurship. So you kind of mentioned that. I didn't necessarily set out to be an entrepreneur. I don't know what it is. It's almost like entrepreneurship kind of just landed on me. I, I wasn't necessarily seeking it or anything like that, but I've always had sort of, you know, this this natural affinity towards, you know, freedom, expression and, and passion. So, you know, even in the workplace, it's always been uh, creative for me. I, you know, I am a very ambitious, hard driving person, but I've always, you know, found, you know, creative ways to sort of step outside the box, which isn't always the best thing when you're in corporate America, because uh, they don't really want you stepping out of their box. You stay right in that box and that's it. So that's really, you know, what I experienced. Now, this business that I have is not my first business. You know, my first business was actually a hair salon. I don't know if you can believe that or not. Um, But yeah, it was a 3000 square foot barber and hair salon. I know nothing about hair. And I don't know if anyone can see me, but I literally have a JLo bun right now. That that's about as creative as I get. Um, Or, you know, when I first started, you know, in that business, but I just really understood the business side of it, you know, and it was an easy business. Um, And stepping into my second business was out of necessity. You know, I worked for a recruiting and and staffing firm, a a $4 billion firm. It's a financial staffing firm. And I just had, you know, wild success. Obviously, I met my husband there and we had wild success together. But being a woman and being a minority woman, there were absolutely glass ceilings. And 
no matter how many goals I achieved, no matter how much revenue I would bring in, no matter how much my home office dependent on my energy and presence, I just couldn't seem to grow after a certain point, you know? And the experience that I had was, was actually the opposite. The more that I did and the more, I guess, quote unquote, power I had, the less opportunity was given to me. And I was actually sort of being asked to step down and step aside and let someone else assume that position. So I said, hail to the no, I'm out, <laughs> peace. And that's when I you know, went into my own business because I wanted to be creative and I wanted to continue the momentum that, you know, that I had created because, you know, my sentiment was this, you know, if you feel like your company environment has made me and that is why I'm successful, we'll make another one. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do my thing. Well, needless needless to say, once I left, 90% of their business was gone within 90 days. And they still have not recovered from this day to this day. Wow. So so walk us through the decision to open JLM, you know, how, how long prior to leaving that role did you and your husband have that idea? Was it you both left at the same time to start the business? Like walk us through kind of when, when the light bulb went on to when you turned in the notice right? and the rest is history. Well, funny story. So I, I really like this question because I, I can really, you know, get into the nuts and bolts of, of, of my story. And I, and I do talk about this on, on my podcast and I am in the middle of writing a book. So a lot of these stories are really fresh in my mind because I'm in those processes. Um, so what had happened was, um, you know, we, so, so my husband and I were business partners and we had just come off like an all time high um, that the company had never, you know, experienced before, at least in, in the region that we were in. And I remember, you know, being called into, you know, the office with my, you know, district manager. And he basically said, well, you know, and it was the holidays. So you, you always have a dip in business during the holidays, right? And then he goes, well, you know, I'm looking at your numbers and you just had an all time high, but now your numbers are trending down and they had just dismantled my team. And it was actually just Jason and I doing the job of six people. And they told me that if you don't change the trend within 30 days, we're going to demote you. And they wanted me to sign paperwork and all this good stuff. And I was livid. I'm, I'm like, I'm your director and I'm your number one producer and I have no team. So, um, so I took the paperwork that they wanted me to sign. I put a bid, a big X through it. And I said, this is my signature. And I, um, shared with my, well, he wasn't my husband at the time. He was my boyfriend, but no one knew we were totally like Jay-Z and Beyonce. Like we just didn't talk about it. Um, but that's a, another story. I digress. Um, but anyway, uh, I explained to him what was going on and he said, you know what? They don't deserve you. And he says, I need you to leave this company or I'm not going to date you anymore. That's what he told me. A week later, I left. I took a position with a competitor three floors down in the same building. Within a year, (laughs) I remember Jason coming down to the third floor where I was and he just busted in my office. And I thought, uh, why are you here? Like, why are you in my office? And he basically said, well, they fired me and I quit and they laid me off all at the same time. Okay. <laughs> and then he says, I'm ready. Let's do this. We've been talking about starting a business. I don't want to go back. It's time. So he actually left first and he spent about a year and a half doing you know, all the dirty work, you know, figuring out, you know, where the business was, you know, I stayed and I continued to work um, and supported him behind the scenes, but he was sort of the hunter ant. He was the one that went out there and got told no, uh, 150,935 times, right? 
And he was the one, you know, to really start crafting this strategy of, you know, how we were going to set ourselves up and how we were going to find a, um, a field that was recession proof. That was right in the heart of when the economy tanked back in 2008 and 2009. And he said, this is the best time for us to start our business because everybody's on the same playing field and we have nowhere to go but up. So that's how we got started. And I said, look, just, just get me one deal and I'll quit my job and I'll, we'll run with it. Well, he got a maybe. That was good enough for me because I wanted the hell out of there. <laughs> quit my job and within a year, we were already earning over a million dollars in revenue. Wow. And, and was the focus always in the infrastructure construction transportation field or has, have you gone in and out of different industries over, over the time? Well, kind of. I mean, when I first left, obviously I had a huge following. So I did have a lot of client base that did follow me. So they weren't necessarily in that arena. So we had to start somewhere. So, so it was sort of residual from that world that I was in, which was multiple industries. And then once we really honed in on where we wanted to be, in the you know infrastructure and transportation space, once you know cities start adopting the different measures to bring in money to build these big projects, then we started to really you know ease into that. And as we got one project, we would get another and another and another. And over time, you know, we phased out, and then we mm -hmm. you know made sure that we held strong to the niche that we were creating. Because I think when you're a small business, it's important that you become specialized, but specialized in an area that has enough room for you to grow and expand. And for us, this was a total blue ocean um, industry. We had no competition. There was no firm that was doing what we were doing for this space because the lead times are long. It's not an easy you know, type of staffing that we do. Um, and we're sort of like a hybrid between traditional and construction management. And so that's a very fine line, but, you know, we had experience, you know, with home builders when we were both at the old firm. So we had already developed a strategy and process that we knew could work in this industry as well. So it was sort of an evolution of things. And let me tell you, I didn't know the difference between an electrical engineer or a structural engineer. I had, I had no clue. I had never really done a whole lot of construction outside just the home building where I was focusing on financial staffing, but I myself had to learn, you know, the different positions and learn the different disciplines myself to be able to talk shop in this industry. So it was a, it was a huge learning curve for the both of us. So for, for our audience members who are wondering what JLM does and is trying to piece the pieces, the puzzle together, let's step back and go to 10,000 feet. Okay. Give me what, what JLM does, what your ideal client looks like, what's a typical project? Yeah. Well, JLM is a staffing partner to large billion dollar infrastructure projects. And so what happens is you have joint ventures, which are several large companies that get together and create what I say is a pop-up company. So imagine, you know, you have a multi-billion dollar pop-up company that lands in, in any particular city and that company needs to be staffed yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so each company is bringing to the table, you know, certain staff, but whenever you have a new company, there's always going to be gaps. And if these companies are not local to the area, then they're not going to have all the talent that they need. But then when you're thinking about talent, well, if you're bringing someone in specifically for a project that is only going to be in existence a finite amount of time, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, who's going to assume responsibility for these employees that are specifically for the project? And once the project's over, they need to leave. Well, if this is a joint venture where the company is not going to be in existence, who handles the employee relations? Who handles the separation of these individuals? So that's what we, 
that's the problem that we solve. So that's what we do. We come in and we fill in those gaps for the projects and we build out teams specifically for the project. And we assume the human relations side of it. And then we take care of all the separation. So essentially we lease people to these billion dollar projects and they pay our people to leave when the project is over. So it's very counterintuitive when you think about it because it's tough when a project is ending, you know, people start jumping ship and it's difficult to get those projects completed um, when you're losing all of your talent. So it's our job to make sure that the talent is secure through the length and all the ebb and flows of the project. So that's what we do. And it's all white collar. So it's no boots on the ground, but it's all of the, you know, um, uh, engineering, project controls, accounting, compliance, procurement, all of those white collar positions that you need for a billion, pro a billion dollar infrastructure project to be completed successfully um, on time and on budget. So that's what we do. That's very helpful. Um, how about on the employee side? Are you developing relationships with employees so that once a project ends in County X and state Y, they become eligible for another project that you're working on with another joint venture? Absolutely. That's the goal. Um, and our philosophy with our candidate and employee base is that we have built a community um, for these individuals to be a part of. So when someone comes to JLM and they become a part of our community, they always have a foundation in us to come back to when their project is over. Because yes, we want to make sure that we're transitioning people in and out of projects as it makes sense for them. I mean, we've had individuals with us from the very beginning that are still with us now. We've been in business um, under the JLM brand for what, almost 11 years now. And we've had individuals that have, you know, done up to five, six, seven different projects with us and they keep coming back. And the more and more we move through this industry, the more we are becoming home for a lot of individuals that want to have freedom and flexibility of when and how they um, secure projects for themselves. So it, it sounds like you guys were way ahead of the pandemic when it comes to remote or non-office working outside the office relationship building. Any mm -hmm. advice on how to instill a corporate culture with a remote workforce? Well, I think, and it's, and it's not an easy thing and, and it hasn't been easy for us, but um, being a small business and being very, you know, immersed in technology from the very beginning has been key for us. Um, back when we started, we insisted that all of our database be on the cloud and people were like, oh my God, blasphemy. You mean you're not going to have a server? You're not going to protect your data? What are you doing? You know, and so, but we saw the bigger picture and we saw where the workforce was heading. So we got ahead of that. So we've always had the ability to work remotely. And in addition to that, we built our own timekeeping software where we're able to track and keep a hold of it, you know, keep sort of a, a, a hold of everybody and where they're at and what they're doing. We have developed ways of communication that keeps our external staff connected to mm -hmm. us um, internally. Um, we've also developed processes that make sure that, you know, employees know that we are their home and we are the ones that are going to take care of them, even though they're spending the majority of their time on our client site, you know, but we are very good at, you know, we go to sites, we will camp out, we will follow up, we will have conversations, you know, we will do activities and things like that with our, with our external staff that just keeps them engaged. And so it's, it's worked really well for us. Fantastic. So shifting gears a little bit, um, from what I know about your podcast, it's not business related or JLM related. It's very much LaShondra related. Talk to us about your podcast. Well, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of both. If you listen mm -hmm. to the first season, it was, it was more business related, but, but it's really just a podcast about 
my experience moving through this entrepreneurial world and what it was like emotionally for me and what are the different lessons that I've learned. Because again, once I figured out that I was a leader, I'm like, oh my gosh, everyone's watching me. But I am feel like I'm old as dirt now. <laughs> so I'm really moving into that space of wisdom from doing you know, because, you know, you, you, you have different stages of evolution of your business self. And I think that I have entered the stage of now it's time for me to give back because I'm, I'm too old and I'm too tired to, to, to do. I don't have anything else to prove. All I have is my blueprint of how I got here, which for, for me is significant because when I look around, if I look to my left and I look to my right, there's no one that looks like me that's doing the things that I'm doing and have, and has the achievement. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people of color that are achieving, but in this particular space where it's dominated by, uh, predominantly, you know, white men, that's important you know, and that needs to be acknowledged and that needs to be exposed and shown that, you know, there is room for change. There is room for someone that looks like me. And I can't tell you how to do it. All I can do is show you how I did it. And whatever you get from that is what you get. And hopefully it's helpful. And if it's not, then don't listen to it. (laughs) (laughs) But this is just my story. And I feel like it's, it's impactful, especially for young girls. I have a daughter, you know, that I think about every single time I hop on this podcast, I think about her experience and, you know, and all the wonderful things that she can do, you know, this is the best that I could do, but I know that on my shoulders, there's someone else that can take the baton and run even further. And that's the point of my podcast. But I do give a lot of business tips and information as well. (laughs) I loved how you said, you know, putting your daughter on your shoulders so that she could take the baton even further by by seeing the examples and understanding the process. In fact, I most of a lot of my conversations with my children are around entrepreneurship and business, and we break things down into, okay, how would you solve this problem in a different way? The non-traditional thinking, you know. Before the pandemic, we were building these note cards that we thought were fun. Anyway, um, that's fantastic. So, Lashandra, talk to us uh, some about your book as well. Is that similar content or is it a, and then do you have a release date? Give us a little bit of FOMO around your book. Well, the the book is, is, is a memoir um, type of book, but it does talk about, you know, sort of the beginnings and how I grew and evolved into where I am now. I didn't come from a uh, traditional household. You know, I had very young parents. My parents were 17 and 19 when my brother and I were born. And, you know, we weren't, uh, you know, wealthy by any means. Um, And, you know, my father, you know, had, you know, uh, bouts with drug addiction. My mother was, had issues with depression. Um, So it wasn't an easy childhood. You know, I was a teen mom at 19, you know, and by the time I was 21, I had two of my two children and a stepson. And I was also raising two teenage sister-in-laws while going to college full-time and working full-time. And I feel like if I can get through that, I can do anything because that was hard. It was rough. And so I just want people to understand that every decision you make does not necessarily mean that you are imprisoned to those decisions. And just because, you know, things happen in your life, maybe sooner than you would prefer that it doesn't have to stop you from, you know, doing the things that you want to do and still achieving and being an example, you know, for others. You know, I definitely could have been a statistic, but I refused. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I got 
tingles going down my spine just hearing <laughs> you tell that story. So, Lashandra, how can our audience members find you? Are you Facebook, LinkedIn? Give us some of your social media, and we'll include those in our show notes. So, and you, those who are listening, you don't have to write it down, but just tell us where where's the best avenue to get connected with you. Well, I'm everywhere. Let me tell you, I'm, you know, and, and, and like I said, I, and I am not a fan of social media. So let me tell you, for, for me to be putting myself out there like this is, is difficult. And I even talk about that because I'm a Gen Xer. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's so hard to, to get into the social media, but, um, but I'm learning and I'm figuring it out. I have an assistant that harasses me every day. And I swear to God, if she makes me take another picture, I'm going to strangle her. Um, but I, I know I have to do it. So I, I love her. Um, so I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. I am on TikTok. So that's new. Mm. I'm on TikTok. And apparently, you know, one of my videos got like 800 views, like all out the blue. I just got on TikTok. And I think I have like, I don't know, like five or 600 followers within like a few weeks. So Hey, I'm going to pop my collar with that one. Um, but, um, but those are sort of the, the major social media um, platforms that you can find me on. And my podcast, you can find it on, you know, Apple, Spotify. And I think there are several others that I don't know the name of right now because I'm over 40 and I don't have a memory. But I will make sure that you have all of those so that you can share them with your audience. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So my, my, my favorite final question you know, looking back over your career so far and all your ups and downs, what advice would you give the younger LaShondra now that you've experienced however many years you've experienced? Whoa, that's a big question. Now I'm getting tingles down my spine (laughs) just by you asking me that question. Um, What I would tell my younger self is number one, you're going to be okay. The bottom is not going to fall out and you no longer need to live your life in fear. Okay. The second thing I would tell her is you can do anything, not that you put your mind to, but that you focus your energy on because what I discovered It's the law of the universe. What you put out is what you get back. And as long as you can control where you focus your energy, then sky's the limit. That's what I would tell her. And then I would say, don't sweat the small stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would probably tell her to uh, break up with my high school boyfriend um, (laughs) sooner than I did. (laughs) That's fantastic. I, I visualized three bumper stickers. Um, <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Anyways, yeah, Lash- yeah, cool. Lashandra, it's been amazing having you on our show. I appreciate your time and your insights and your vulnerability. Um, that wasn't in our scripts, but I really appreciate you going there and, and sharing um, those experiences. It's been amazing to have you on the show. Well, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. And, you know, I hope that your audience really, you know, connects with what I'm saying and hopefully they have some aha moments for themselves. So um, I love doing this and I appreciate you for having me on. It's been, been my honor and my pleasure. Fantastic. I'll talk to you soon. And that's a wrap, my friends. Thank you for spending your time with me. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at impactfulleadershipshow.com. One last food for thought. Walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone.